So when we were trying to put this uh, event together and uh, figuring out what the panel should look like, we thought that FinTech would be an area that would be of interest to a lot of people. Uh, moderating this panel is Chandra Kidambi. Chandra is a technologist with extensive industry experience building large-scale internet applications and services in internet security, security payments and retail domains. He leads the payment digitization platform at Visa to further the vision of accelerating digital payments across the world for in-person and e-commerce transactions. Before joining Visa, Chandra held engineering leadership positions at Symantec, Yardley, Amazon, and Infosys. Chandra has multiple patents in the areas of security and device identity. He holds a bachelor's degree in technology from IIT Madras and has postgraduate degree in management from Indian Institute of Management at Lucknow. So we asked each panelist to give us a fun fact to share with the audience. So Chandra says that his cricket bowling action is supposed to be like Jaspreet Bumrah's action. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was not communicated to the batsman, and Chandra has had very little success as a bowler. So I guess that's why Chandra is here and uh, you know talking to us, and Jaspreet is uh, playing IPL in India today or tomorrow, I guess. Uh, also on the panel is Arvind Purushan. And by the way, Chandra is from Alak. We also wanted to associate hostels just to go down memory lane. Uh, Arvind Purushottam is the global head of venture investing at uh, Cities. I'm sorry. Arvind leads Cities' efforts to invest in and partner with startups as a way to bring technology based innovation to Cities' businesses. He focuses his investments in financial services, cybersecurity, and enterprise infrastructure. Prior to City, Arvind spent nearly a decade as a managing director at Menlo Ventures and was a design engineer and program manager at Intel Corporation prior to that. In his spare time, he enjoys running, photography, and reading. Arvind is, a, is passionate about golf, a passion sadly that his skill level does not match. Well, that's his opinion. I don't know what the people who play with him say. Uh, he lives in Palo Alto with his wife and two sons, and they are black Labrador Rocky. And Arvind is from Dharma. Our next panelist is Nitin Barbe. Nitin has over 25 years in the investment industry as a practitioner, academic, and as a consultant to more than 75 investment firms. He has worked in fintech even before the word was added in the Oxford English Dictionary. So Nith is probably dating himself, but that's okay. As a fun fact, inadvertently, Nithin had pet food for breakfast for a few days back in the 80s on his first overseas trip to Europe. Sorry about that. Along with other friends. He has good reasons to explain, but he won't take up the panel's time trying to have him explain that. He can probably do so, not over lunch, if you don't want it. <laughs> uh, Ram Palniyapan is a financial tech entrepreneur whose mission is to create products that make money work better for everyone. Isn't that something we all want? As his first company, Ram began helping his employees by writing them personal checks when they needed money before payday. This hack to bring flexibility to rigid paychecks laid the foundation for Ram's next venture, Earnin, which aims to reinvent the way people get paid and liberate the over one trillion held up every two weeks in the payroll system. Using the app, people are able to access a portion of the wages they've earned any time they want without waiting for payday. Earnin currently helps people from more than 25,000 companies access wages that would otherwise have been held up in the pay cycle. Ram holds an MMS from the Birla Institute of Technology and Science 
and an MBA from Purdue's Cranor School of Management. So Ram is from Bits and we welcome you. Our last panelist is Schwark. Schwark Satyavur. Schwark makes early stage investments in fintech, security, and AI. He's a serial entrepreneur. Schwark co-founded Yordley, which was acquired by Investment, and Troyavis, which was acquired by Mastercard. Previously, Schwark held senior exec positions at LifeLock and Mastercard. He began his career at Microsoft after completing graduate school in computer science. He is an inventor on 15 patents. In Schwark, which hospital are you in? Goda. Goda, there we go. Okay. So that's the panel. Over to Chandra to take it from you. Thanks, Karen, for kicking us off. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this panel. Uh, I think this is a really exciting topic. Uh, if you see, technology has been transforming finance as we know it. Uh, FinTech used to be like the sleepy backwaters of innovation. But over the years, over the last maybe uh, 15, 20 years, all the developments in different areas like cloud computing, uh, mobile technologies, which has led to increasing the easier distribution of applications. Uh, even regulation, like nations and uh, regulators want to adopt a digital economy. Millennials also want newer ways of being able to manage their finances. All this has almost, uh, I would say, ushered in a golden age of fintech. That is just, it has attracted so much uh, financial, uh, like capital, and also entrepreneurial talent to fintech that we are seeing so much innovation happening here. It's a really exciting place to be in, uh, and uh, being able to witness this plethora of innovation that's happening is uh, really nice as a technologist. So let's, uh, with that, let's just get kicked off. We have a really amazing group of panelists here to share their insights with us on FinTech. Uh, let me just get started. So, uh, Schwark, uh, we have known each other for a really long time. You have been in FinTech uh, for a couple of decades or more. Uh, so, uh, what are the big trends that you see in FinTech from your vantage point as an investor? So I think uh, FinTech has kind of become more the uh, center of the fairway for innovation today. Um, I think back when you and I were working together, you only, I think it was, it was uh, truly in the backwater mm -hmm. scenario. Like, uh, I still remember it was almost impossible to raise money for Yodley because people did not want to touch anything that actually involved uh, working with banks or working with uh, this highly regulated aspects. Um, today, I think that has become far more the center of the fairway. It, it is uh, not only accepted, but also very uh, desired uh, by investors and consumers to kind of leverage all these different new uh, kinds of products and services. But I think there's three areas I feel like there is um, uh, tremendous amounts of innovation on. One um, is probably the most boring, but probably the highest impact, which I think is financial infrastructure. So there is uh, infrastructure that runs the entire core of the financial services system is very, very dated and, and uh, somewhat behind the times in terms of uh, the amount of investment that's gone in. And a lot of the work that has happened has happened mostly at the front end layer. So when you see a mobile app that actually is talking to, that you're talking to with most of your banking services, the back ends of all of these systems are still running on mainframes and so on and so forth. So there's a whole lot of stuff between that app on your phone and that mainframe on the back end that's somewhat masking the fact that it's actually running on that relatively um, um, data technology because it's a very big investment to try and move stuff around. And that's just on the retail side of the you know, capital market side and so on and so forth. There's so much, of, there's literally trillions of dollars going uh, uh, day in and day out. And a lot of that is still happening in, uh, in relatively slow, relatively um, manual ways. So there's a lot of infrastructure innovation that's happening. Um, you're probably less familiar with all those names because they're not 
as uh, commons household names, but they're actually uh, truly changing how the core of the financial services infrastructure is changing. The second, I think, is probably the place where everybody sees these things, which I think is more of these direct-to-consumer uh, replacements, if you may, for existing solutions that come from the large financial services organizations. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, momentum there. This momentum actually started outside the U.S. where the regulatory frameworks make it a lot easier, but it seems like in the U.S. Uh, there's a lot more appetite uh, to actually create these uh, solutions, and we can talk a lot more about how that's, uh, that's happening. I think Brown's company is clearly one of those kinds of companies. And then, then we have the third bucket, which I think is the modernization of business per se. Right? So if you think about payments in general, uh, or any kind of money movement has always been a parallel aspect of business. So you actually create a transaction, you, you consummate a transaction, and then you have a separate payment flow that basically kind of go, goes along with that transaction. And uh, increasingly, those, those, those financial uh, dealings that accompany a transaction are getting subsumed by and becoming transparent to the actual transaction itself. And uh, you know, one simple example could be like uh, you know your your act of uh, having a ride today, for example, right? You oftentimes when you actually rode in the car before, you actually not only hail the ride, got in the car, finished the thing, but then there was a financial transaction that actually ended up happening either with cash or with card or some other mechanism. Today, that's kind of been subsumed into the um, to the action of doing this thing, and that's a consumer. Uh, use case. So the same kinds of things are happening in B2B solutions and even B2C solutions. So there's a lot of different things that are actually happening where the, the financial transactions are being subsumed into business processes and integrating these two systems in such a way that one subsumes the other and becomes transparent. And there's a whole lot of innovation that's happening um, in that, on those areas as well. So thanks for it. Uh, Arvind, can you also add to it, like from your perspective as being within a larger organization, right? Uh, how do you see, what trends do you see, and anything additional you can add? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, the, the fintech world, you know, I started at City in, in 2011, and, um, and then when it, it was initially started, it was entrepreneurs who, who said, look, you know, we don't like the big banks, we want to do things independently, and, and now I would say it's a much more collaborative thing, and part of it is because big banks like Citi or Chase or even others have all set up units like ours, you know, they are open to partnering with startups, and startups also realize that they can actually get distribution or, or get large customer contracts when they work with a big bank, so I think it's a lot more open ecosystem right now, which I think is, is great. Um, you know, two things that, that I talk about, um, one is actually really great to see, which is, you know, I think of sort of the neobank uh, ecosystem as coming of age in the U.S. Um, so when you look at neobanks, that term usually associated with the U.K., like there are uh, banks like Monzo, et cetera, that got started, and it's been actually later in the U.S. for all kinds of regulatory reasons, as, as uh, Schwartz was alluding to. But now you have, you know, companies like a Chime or Acorns or Stash or, or others where the business model seems to be working. I mean, by the way, we're, we're not investors in any of them, but just observing uh, you know, what's happening and this, the, the rate at which uh, these companies are growing, it's actually great to see. And, and it's sort of a maturation of the ecosystem. It's also uh, consumers expressing their view that, hey, for, for certain types of services and for convenience, I'm willing to pay. Because almost all of these guys charge you a buck or two bucks or three dollars uh, a month, and and that's actually great to see because until about you know let's say two to three years ago, there were lots of attempts, but there was really no viable business model. Now there seem to be some viable business models, which is great to see. The other thing that we're spending some time on is it, what's been called prop tech, or or in the in general in the real estate area. Um, we made we made two investments in that space. As you can imagine, one of the largest markets out there in, in the in the U.S. and globally. Uh, last year, we invested in a company called Unison, which uh, enables you to actually buy a house by, you know, quote unquote, selling some of your equity to, to a fund uh, to enable you to purchase the house that you want to purchase. And I think that we think that that's a trem tremendously big idea. Um, um, we we're also investors in a company like Homelight, but whether it's sort of these funding marketplaces enabling people to buy their first home in a easier fashion, I think we see 
lots of activity in, in that world, which is quite exciting. Thanks, Sarva. So when you're talking about those two uh, areas you funded, I was just thinking about there are different segments of the socioeconomic status, people in socioeconomic status. There are some people uh, who are living paycheck to paycheck, right? Like where uh, solutions like earn and come in. And I see both of you sitting right next to each other. <laughs> so, and then the other side, you have people who are more worried about wealth management, right? Like the more affluent segment of the population who wants to invest their money better and earn higher rates of uh, return. So uh, there are going to be different solutions for different markets. Maybe uh, Ram, if you can start about maybe the uh, people who are living paycheck to paycheck, right? Like uh, getting, uh, what are the solutions that you see in the market, right? Where people are able to, like your startup is a great idea for doing that. Other things that you see, trends for supporting that uh, segment of the population. <clears throat> I mean, so it's a really large part of the population, and even though we might think it was like there's the people with paycheck to paycheck as everybody else, I think the problems of the people with paycheck to paycheck actually affects everybody. Um, I mean, as a country, the US spends more on overdraft than it does on fresh vegetables, um, which is just crazy. Yes. But if like all of you out here have free checking, it's because your housekeeper or your Children as a teacher, the person who factory zero, paid overdraft fees, and so that's what got you free checking. This is like this huge amount of frustration in the country, and like you can kind of like attribute that kind of frustration with most in most of the country to things like we have wrecking ball of government, and like there's all these social issues that come from um, such a large part of the country being frustrated that I think it actually affects all of us. It's kind of interesting if you look at the financial system; it's really two-faced. Um, on one hand, it helps the wealthy, and on the other side, it exploits the poor. So it's this really efficient way to create inequality. Um, the core banking model is based off a checking account. With the checking account, you put your money into the checking account. They pay you very little interest. They take that money, they give it out in mortgages or loans. And so the core banking business model is a margin-based um, business model. Now, if you take an account that has very low balance or volatile balance, that business model doesn't work. <laughs> but the bank wants to make money anyway on every account. And so they stick it with overdraft fee. Um, so finally, like they got the uh, they got the economy profitable, but they screwed up the individual. Um, and so that's like created a lot of opportunity for companies like us, but the model has to be different. But it's not a margin-based business model. Um, and so, I mean, the other piece of that's interesting with fintech is like it's hard because all of the VCs put lots of money in it. Uh, but they do that because there's like these huge companies like Chase and Wells Fargo that have huge valuations with terrible user experiences and negative net uh, promoter scores. <coughs> and so there's like a lot of value at the end of the day, but getting there is difficult because of regulation. Like banks have privileged access to deposits. As a fintech, I can't take deposits, but the bank can take deposits. Um, they have privileged access to money movement rails. I can't become a member of Visa or MasterCard or ACH, but banks can have access to all those rails. Um, they have privileged access to regulation because they can get a national charter. I have to deal with that at like a state-by-state -state level. So like there's all of these huge regulatory protections that are set up to protect the existing incumbents. And so um, for fintech companies, you've got to figure out like small areas where you can play. And largely what we've done is we've said, rather than rely on like the legal framework, we're going to rely much more on the moral framework. So we like we don't charge any fees, say pay whatever you think is fair. Most people actually want to pay what is fair. Our product is structured as a non-recourse product. So we have no right to collection. There's like contacts all pretty light. Um, but most people actually want to pay you back if they take money. And so we basically said, like, we don't need any legal protection. We'll rely on the moral framework. <coughs> um, and so like, that's the approach that we've taken. The types of products that you see are very different. And some of the things that are not so visible in, if you look at us from the outside, some of the things that we do are, we have a feature called Balance Shield, where we watch your bank account. And if your bank account goes low, we push your wages automatically. And so that prevents an overdraft fee. And so banks have algorithms to maximize their overdraft fees, and we have the counter algorithm to uh, put money in before the, uh, before the bank hits, uh, hits you with overdraft fees. Um, another one that we do is because we see all the bank transactions and we notice that medical bills are a large cause of personal bankruptcies, we have a team of billing specialists. And so as soon as one of our users gets a medical bill, we actually see them in an ER, we have them upload the medical bills to us and we negotiate medical bills. And so we do make medical bills, there's a handful of other companies that do like Comcast bills and Verizon, DirecTV. 
So there's this whole um, set of companies that are now negotiating bills for customers. Um, one of the other things that we do is, um, so this one is not yet live, but there's a waiting list that's public. <coughs> um, so lots of you have credit cards, and credit cards give you rewards. <coughs> Um, but if you're in my customer segment, you don't get a credit card with rewards. And it's essentially what we've done is we've taken a rewards network, and we're going to layer it on top of your existing debit card from your bank. And so then you actually can get a rewards um, like card from your bank, but the rewards are coming to us, then we put it to a savings account. And so you, you see a whole bunch of different products like this. I think that would not be what you would be used to using if you were not in the segment, but these are your financial needs. That's very cool what you're working on. I think uh, I can really appreciate it, right? The financial inclusion. Many of us, like I know we are all here right now in Silicon Valley, probably closer to the affluent <coughs> section, but we also, many of us have experienced that growing up in India. So that's really cool. Yeah, one, if right, I go ahead. one thing to, to what you said, right? I think the, the regulatory aspect of it cuts both ways, right? Um, one of the things, I mean, I'm a tech guy, and when I started to, to work at City, the thing that was amazing is to the, the extent to which the regulators monitor what you do, right? They're, you know, our tech guys are talking to the regulators on how systems are set up, where our data lives, where it goes, how it flows. Uh, of course, the businesses are talking to them. And, and so there's also sort of the regulatory arbitrage aspect, which I think is real, right? Which is I think that startups, when, when the startups are younger, kind of get a pass, and then if they get the chance to set it up, I mean, you can't be big and not be compliant, but, but you get the chance to like set it up and grow those processes as, as time goes on, which I think is, is a good thing, right? I think that, that helps uh, startups and the ecosystem grow. But to the point on, on financial inclusion, uh, I think you know, we've been asked by the, the Treasury and, and other people, um, on what our thoughts are about financial inclusion and, and regulation in general, and regulation of fintechs. And, and one of the points that we have made uh, to the government is lack of regulations actually hurts innovation, right? When once, or gray areas, gray, is, gray areas hurt innovation. When you actually have clear cut rules, it becomes easier. Um, and uh, whether it comes to payday lending or, or any of these other areas, clearly there's a need, it's a multi billion dollar need. Um, so why not go fix it? And, and that's just been a problematic thing. Completely uh, agree with you, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to talk about one other hot area. Sorry. Don? Okay. One of the hot words around is the robo-advisors, and that's one thing that I work very closely on. So it's kind of touches on the inclusion. One other interesting factoid is that, of course, it doesn't apply to anyone in this room, I suppose. But uh, I, I read a statistic about 40% of the Americans are about $400 car repair away from a bankruptcy. So they are really struggling. If we're talking about investment management, we really often think about people in this room or people in the valley. But that's not true America. That's not the true demographic. So robot advisors uh, has been a huge boom because it not only caters to the wealthy investors, we actually have seen people with multi-million dollars of assets investing in a simple hands-off robo product. But it also allows someone with a thousand dollar investing uh, balance to start getting invested. And I still remember my first trade when I did uh, back in about 25 years ago. I only had three thousand dollars to invest and it took me about two or three weeks to open an account, fund it, made an appointment with a broker in San Francisco and I told her just find a stock that I can buy hundred shares of for less than three thousand dollars. And she had this big mainframe computer. She found me something for $28, $28.50, asked bid. And then I paid $50, $55 of commission and fees. So by the time I walked out of the broker's office, my portfolio was down 4%. And it had taken me three weeks. So that has all changed now. The technology has allowed investors to do all of this, perhaps within 24 hours. You can buy hundreds and hundreds of mutual funds and ETFs and stocks for maybe $3, $2, even zero. There's actually a movement uh, by firms like Salt Financial where actually they're going to pay you to invest in their products. So the, the pressure on fees is, is one big trend that as an industry we are struggling with. And in our industry we often joke about Starbucks where we wish we were like Starbucks where they did something where they started charging four or five dollars for something that all of us used to get for free in the offices. And we are lining up for you know, their coffee and it's often Arguably, it's often not as good as the one you get in the offices. 
And here we drop the fees from $50 to $2 and nobody's lining up to buy our funds or products. We're all chasing those investors with you know, small or large balances. So it's a very different dynamic in the industry. And one thing I would uh, just touch upon uh, to extend what Satya said, there is a non-glamorous side of the investment industry, it's called infrastructure or fund management, reconciliation, back office. That still has a lot of old legacies. So the FinTech hasn't made any dent there. So uh, if you uh, have seen how a fund is managed from inside, you probably want to invest in one. <laughs> so uh, be careful about that. A lot of the, uh, I don't invest in individual funds. <laughs> Uh, a lot of work, uh, not only Schwab, but uh, I, should, I should be careful, but a lot of big firms are still run by, their, their software projects are still run by when those two cobalt programmers are available. So, <laughs> going back to the mainframe point, it, it, still, it still has a long way to go in some pockets. What has changed is the inclusion on the experience side, availability of products, and the price pressure. If I, if I may just want to make one comment to uh, bridge a couple of these points here. Uh, if you talk about innovation in fintech, there is a certain level of innovation today that I think is uh, what I'll call in this unsustainable bucket. What I mean by that is it, it uh, over leverages on regulatory arbitrage, for example. Right? I think regulatory arbitrage is a key area. And there are some very big names that were created in regulatory arbitrage, by the way. SoFi is a perfect example of regulatory arbitrage. Most large banks cannot give. Um, uh, education loans basically only to the, the best credit people and, and, this, and basically not serve the rest, right? So you cannot do that as a big bank. But so far you could do that. They cherry picked all the, the, the parts of the, the portfolio that are actually um, uh, helpful to serve and, and so on and so forth. So I think that that creates some big companies, but it's unclear how that's going to sustain because at some point, I believe, you will get regulated. So the regular department will close. Now, if you get to a very, very large size before that happens, you're in a great place. Another big example of that, I think there are also a lot of the neobanks. A lot of the neobanks' primary business model today is actually interchange revenue, honey, debit interchange. Debit interchange for most larger banks is actually regulated down to a very, very small number. So it's really hard to make a business work if that was your only primary uh, revenue model. But if you're smaller than a certain size, then you actually still get to keep the, the larger interchange numbers. and then you can actually build it, but then I, effectively, again, you're building a business that is destined to effectively kind of collapse on its own weight, if you may. So there's a lot of things like that that are happening that I do think, uh, at least I would be a little bit more skeptical about as you kind of think look at the long term. As an investor, there may be good investments for me to look at because I might be in and out of them before these things actually happen. But um, if I look at it from a fintech innovation over a long period of time, I do think certain things are going to be less interesting. And I actually think that if you look at the area of investing, uh, the area of the population that's actually most interesting to serve, it's actually much harder to make money off of the affluent customers. And uh, there is, in fact, a race down to zero with fees and so on and so forth. In most cases, I don't know if that's really a good thing because it actually makes for an unsustainable product stack. You're actually just putting the big banks out of business, but it's not clear you're actually putting them out of business with a sustainable model. You're doing it with an unsustainable model, and that has to collapse at some point. Right? But it's actually a lot easier to make money off of the, the folks that are under a lot more financial stress, which is actually why the entire financial industry, like Ram pointed out, is actually built on the bottom end of the spectrum, not on the top end of the spectrum. Nobody in this room has ever paid any, any bank any real fees. Right? If I can just jump in for a quick second. The regulations, I think, are important, as Arvind said. I think, actually, the technology has also come with a little bit of a negative uh, side impact on the world of finance. We've had a flash crash and you know, many other things that are not so well known as a flash crash. They have happened in small, actually not small, but relatively unknown large pockets of the industry, like derivatives or IPOs. I don't know how many of you know the BATS, you know, the Better Alternative Trading System IPO, that actually, you know, the software company that was trying to make the whole IPO process much better, their own IPO actually, you know, had a lot of issues on day one, so they pretty much backed out. So we've had lots of those, and unless you have good oversight, good controls, good compliance, good regulations, I think the technology, like any other tool, if it falls in the wrong hands, it can be misused, abused, and uh, Moore's law can easily convert into Murphy's law. You know, when things do go wrong, 
<laughs> when computers are involved, they go wrong much faster and much grander style. So I think uh, what Arvind said, uh, we, we uh, I would say we respect compliance and uh, regulators, but I think that that's a good, good, uh, good framework to be working within. So on a completely different dimension, right? Like uh, uh, Arvind, like larger organizations are now also trying to get into this fintech space by having innovation centers, accelerators, incubators internally. You are in the city investing group, right? So, uh, what what would you say are the objectives of these larger organizations in starting these, and how are they engaging with the startup community? Sure. Um, so I think you know, sort of talking about my own organization, City Ventures, maybe a, sort of an interesting view into that. So we that's part of what we do, right? This is sort of what we think of as bringing the outside in, and so. One big part of that is making venture investments in companies and, and then driving partnerships with these companies, which we've been able to do you know, very, very successfully. And so um, you know, we see Chase doing that, we see Goldman doing that, we see you know, uh, Wells, uh, Amex and you know, BBVA, all these guys doing that you know, quite, quite actively. And so, uh, so that's one aspect of how uh, large banks are, are getting into the ecosystem. Uh, with respect to accelerators, I think there is most accelerator activities from large banks I feel are marketing activities, right? So you get a view into what's going on, you, you meet entrepreneurs, you you know get more involved with the ecosystem, but does it really you know help you identify capabilities or startups that are really you know uh, capabilities of the future for you? Probably not, because accelerators are typically very early stage companies, and so uh, most of those don't end up Get you know panning out. Maybe they don't even make it to their Series A round, right? So, so they turn out to be um, you know sort of uh, marketing activities. But selectively, we you know we like some of them. So, uh, one of the groups at City, they actually run an accelerator in Tel Aviv, and, and that ecosystem is a pretty small ecosystem. And City has a pretty big brand there, so they're able to actually attract some great companies there, and that ends up being a, a good way to even source companies for our investment program. So you have to do it selectively and know what you're trying to do. If it's just marketing, that's okay. I mean, you're a big bank, you can afford to do it. Uh, but I think actually taking some of those companies that you meet and turning them into capabilities or offerings for your customers and clients, that I think is, is extremely hard. Um, and, and then the last thing that I would say is we also have an internal program where, not my team, but a, a sort of a, a, a peer team, they end up helping our, our product units, our business units, actually um, start their own companies internally, right, as a way to grow organically. Um, I would say it's still early days, and I think we have some great projects that are ongoing, but, you know, sort of big companies typically say, hey, we're going to build this thing, and it's going to be, you know, $80 million in five years, right? And so we're trying to change that, that kind of thinking into thinking more sort of the lean startup way, right? Let's start, let's verify a consumer need and then you know, put small amounts of money to it and then kill the projects if they're not panning out, but if they are, let's give them more capital. So it's a system that you know, my colleagues have set up, which is still, you know, I would say, early days, but uh, on the track. Thanks, Arvin. Yeah, now uh, we went through our time really fast, so now we are in the audience Q&A section. So we're going to take the next 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, and then we'll have some last five minutes for some closing remarks from the panelists. So there's a mic out in the back. If you guys want to line up there, uh, I'll be good. I'll, I'll be the first mic. Yeah, hi. Uh, though I'm not exactly from fintech space, like uh, I'm working on something different for uh, transportation. But um, my question is, like, I mean, especially like working with India, like because we have uh, offices in India and we tend to kind of work with India. I mean, one of the things that I see is like, while the underlying internet technologies many of you are familiar with are not that fragmented, like whether it's in China. It's a placebo theory. 
I guess you heard it. You heard me to laugh, I see. But I mean, and things are quite fragmented and you know very different once we kind of get to the fintech space. Like you know, ultimately, like the way I view fintech is, I mean, they promise a lot of money for <laughs> to the user, but ultimately it's about user experience. It's, a, it's a <coughs> thing is still technology, like which matters to the point that where it is actually about user experience much more than really making the money for the user. Uh, in that sense, like, uh, there are two aspects to that. Like, I mean, one thing could be under innovation, and other thing could be hyper innovation, where the user experience kind of gets uh, so kind of impacted. Uh, but uh, I mean, what's your experience working with international markets and you know trying to kind of streamline these things to a point where you know the user experience for especially people who like to work with international markets kind of uh, in some way, shape, or form. Like, I mean, one of the things that I had trouble with is especially every time I use a tax tool, like you know. I have a real <laughs> terrible <laughs> user experience, whether they give me the best refund or not, like, I mean, I have to kind of uh, run through a, quite a few groups to kind of file my taxes. That's about my experience with fintech tools, like, you know, though I'm not a fintech person per se, but uh, I mean, I just wanted your opinion on that. Um, well, there are two parts to it, and I'm not, not sure exactly how the two are connected. Uh, one point I'd make about international and, uh, and financial services is, Financial services tend to be very local, right? Because of regulatory regimes, because of industry structure, because of all these things. So you don't have, it takes a long time for companies in the fintech space or financial services in general to, to go to other parts of the world. But your point of, on user experience, I think, is, is a good one. Uh, we, one of our areas of investment is user experience, precisely because of that, because they may, you may have, you know, City may have some great products now, but Three months later, somebody else introduces that, or we introduce something that somebody else had. So those kind of promotions and offers and products, uh, I think, uh, sometimes tend to get uh, commoditized. So, and so then the experience becomes the product, right? And uh, in today's world, with mobile and online and everything, and so uh, we do think that that's a very important uh, aspect of, you know. And I think Schwark, you brought up the point about user experience as well. So uh, that's true. Yeah, so, like, really quickly, and I think some of it is the way the ecosystem is evolving. Like, look at the payment rails out here, so it be some MasterCard. They've got complete coverage. It's tough for anybody else to actually start up out here. If you look at India, it's like India stack now from the government, um, where they kind of like force it on everybody, and that forcing function of a modern stack has suddenly made like the Google wallet and uh, the WhatsApp wallet more popular than Paytm. Yeah, to be fair, like, in fact, they may have some very good technologies themselves, like, but they are either not able to kind of uh, make them global, or we are not able to kind of you know work with the integrated bodies there. And yeah. So it kind of gets very fragmented. Yeah. And I mean, on the, uh, the your tax experience, like I wonder why we have that user experience too. Like the government's going to check my tax bill and just tell me what I should pay. If I agree, it would be okay. So we're filling out a whole problem. Like it would be much simpler if they just told me what I should pay. So I mean, we kind of had that because of how we got up here. But okay, I I actually have a slightly maybe. Um, controversial point of view on user experience and financial services. I believe user experience is kind of like a, a nice to have and eventually we'll get there just because you know the evolution of technology is getting, everything is getting modernized so user experience will, will improve over time. I mean financial services specifically I'm much more skeptical of someone that's actually primarily innovating on user experience because I think financial services is a lot more about infrastructure, regulatory, you know, uh, ability to, you know, uh, uh, survive and thrive in the regulatory framework. So, for example, I believe that every one of these neo banks and so on and so forth that actually came up and said we're going to do this on a, on a, uh, um, a regulatory, I mean, a user experience type thing, will eventually have to kind of become more like the traditional banks. They actually create multiple product lines because. Uh, financial services is a lot more about customer acquisition than it's about user experience, user experience. And so amortizing your cost of acquisition is really what's going to make the business work. I personally feel like this pure pure user experience as, as the primary innovation angle is going to be hard to build a company around. The user experience has to be achieved through... I can, maybe we can continue the discussion later. So we, we have maybe time for a couple of more questions. Uh, and we can definitely have continue the conversation outside. Okay. So my question is, uh, can you guys talk uh, about what innovation is going on in the area of student debt? That's like a huge problem. Like everyone talks about it, but it's also kind of regulated because the government is involved. Uh, curious to see what's going on there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
I'll just start with something very quick. Uh, student learning is a huge problem. It's actually almost uh, a latent, uh, kind of the next time bomb is how we see it. Uh, we actually have seen some uh, retirees now that they still have, we're starting to help them advise with their retirement. They said we still have student loans from our 40 years ago loans. So it's a big problem. Uh, I think there are some, some fintechs that are starting to uh, securitize and come up with ways to uh, you know, work with the regulators and uh, bring you, give you some kind of a relief. But I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. It's, it's kind of spilling beyond the students' population. I have a team that's trying to negotiate student loans now as well. So if you know anyone who has problems, you can send them away. By a student loan, I think fundamentally is is a uh, doesn't have as much government support in order to kind of truly try to innovate in in a in a way. I do think there's a lot of companies that are out there that are trying to help employers who are actually trying to uh, ultimately start to carry some of the load of that of that debt to uh, try and start to pitch in. But unlike 401ks and other kinds of things that they actually pitch in in healthcare, 401ks, they're actually all tax advantage for the employer. And student loans happens to naturally have no real tax support or tax advantage support. I do think that will change in the near future. And when that does, I think the amount of innovation that happens in student loans will actually multiply many forward. But aren't there, like, here and there, you hear about some companies coming up with alternate models uh, that take the you know, loan that may be coming to an employer? Do you see much uh, happening in that place, or is kind of very? Uh, those are very. So those, I think we're talking about like income sharing agreements, the yeah. ISAs, yeah. and yes, there are a lot of people are actually going down that path. The thing is, so that again, it's a very very small fraction, and it's going to really be hard to scale those kind of things. Managing all those kind of things, those commitments, is is a little bit. Yeah, I, I, it's it's remains to be seen if those can actually scale. So if we can move to the next question. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm not in the area of fintech. I'm just a graduate student at Stanford, and uh, I hear the word blockchains a lot. So I wanted like an honest opinion from like five of you on what blockchains, because you've been in this industry for quite some time. Do you think blockchains can help parts of fintech, or do you think it's just a buzzword going around? Thanks. I can take it. Uh, so. Uh, I think blockchains do have some real value add of what they can do. And the vast majority of everything you're seeing right now are hype. Um, so uh, th this is not unlike what we saw in the late 90s with the internet, so to speak. So that, that doesn't mean the internet was completely useless. It just means that a lot of what you're seeing at that point was was hype. Uh, so I do think as a, fu as a foundation, there are actually some real interesting things that can happen. I actually think that um, the, the blockchain as it's kind of talked about today is going to be harder to scale because there are some anarchist foundations to the blockchain which I think uh, actually make it less useful. But if you kind of take different aspects of the blockchain that take away some of the anarchist foundations and actually think about what the core value adds or the distributed ledger are, there's some interesting things that can be done. And I actually invested in one company that's revolutionizing capital market settlement using distributed ledger. Yeah. Just to add to that, like uh, I have some experience with it. Distributed ledger is a technology, while Bitcoin is a virtual currency. Uh, we don't see uh, distributed ledger technologies supporting consumer payments as it exists today. But there are definitely a lot of other uses of blockchain as a technology and distributed ledger as a technology that we are looking at. Thank you. Um, so I would like to see a future where big banks don't control our lives um, because I would say that the big banks are really in more trouble. Every recession is caused by big institutions in this country. So given that peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, is being talked about credit, uh, bitcoins and cryptocurrencies and even peer-to-peer -peer lending, do you all see a lot of activity in the venture capital world that's that may change the future of uh, big banks? Well, um, happy to start. I think it was maybe for you What makes you think that? So, I mean, the question about peer to peer uh, lending, I think it was peer to peer lending you said, or? Or uh, even wallet transaction. Or for wallet transaction. Um, look, I think. Uh, with respect to the peer-to-peer, the -peer, somewhat is a sort of a solved problem. I, I don't see a lot of new innovation happening in that space. 
because lots of things have happened. You know, mobile wallets. You know, now you have the the Apple Pay's and the the, the Google uh, wallets and so on and so forth. Uh, you have NFC, which is coming in to the U.S. This is the U.S. center view, so you know NFC coming into the U.S. quite quite a bit. Um, the big banks have gone with uh, something called Zelle that you may have seen, which you can you know directly take and, and you know send and, and pay uh, from your bank account without going and setting up a new wallet. Which the, the volumes of Zelle have gone up quite dramatically. Um, so uh, all of that is uh, is happening. Um, I think the the um, <coughs> let me stop there and run. <laughs> Um, well, so I think like the way lots of people think of peer to peer is a very simplistic one, but if you think of like big banks versus what is it previously was community banks, and community was very much a peer to peer kind of ecosystem, and like what we're creating is very much like that in Um People usually <coughs> end up helping each other out, and so if you chose to tip us, and the tip was more than what the cost of the transactions, we tell you that, and if you still wanted to be the same tip, then we just seriously go to help somebody else, and the next person who comes to the app will say, message, so I had done that. There'll be a message to the next user that says, Ram already covered the cost of your transaction. And they would send me a thank you message. And so that, like there's tens and tens of thousands of thank you messages every day for your users. But that isn't a way of peer-to-peer -peer kind of setup where people are helping each other stay out of bad financial products. Um, another example is like, we get hundreds of videos, um, a month from our users about how this helps them. And we had a small video production team that would make ads for us and then they found out the videos that were made by our users actually perform better in ads than our own videos. And so now they repurpose themselves and they run a content creators program. So we periodically bring our users in, teach them how to make videos, and then they go back out and they all like, create their own YouTube channels. And so to me that is like peer to peer, we're kind of encouraging the community. Um, and we are very community centric. Probably more than big banks. <laughs> but I would, I would say that I think uh, peer to peer models don't scale very well. So I think ultimately all peer-to-peer -peer models will actually look like everything is scale. Like the reason that community banks are community banks are because they don't scale that much farther. So when you actually look at something that is peer-to-peer -peer lending club was a peer-to-peer -peer system, wasn't really peer-to-peer, -peer, right? So when it scaled, when it got to scale, there was very little of that volume that actually was coming from individuals. Most of the volume was coming from capital markets. So yeah. City of San Jose actually just announced yesterday that they're trying to set up a community bank. Uh, but it's actually in partnership with JP Morgan. So I, <laughs> I think uh, we're running out of time. So uh, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. We'll take a yeah, we'll take questions. one more question. Okay. Yeah. We are going to squeeze the break a little bit in the interest of interesting questions. Okay, sure. <laughs> Let's go ahead. All right. First of all, good morning. I'm I'm really proud. Pleasure to be hosting all of you at Service Now today. And Thank you. Thank you. The panelists, uh, uh, the fintech space uh, is rich with data. We want to understand what your thoughts on of where you see adoption of AI is in, in leveraging AI to improve uh, within fintech space, and what is where, where have we seen some of the most successful adapt, adoption, and where you see the, the trends going to be in adoption of AI? Um, say, um, sort of happy to take that. Uh, I think uh, we're in the very early stages is, is sort of really what I would say, the, the way I would summarize it. Um, I think all the large companies, not just necessarily in financial services, but even in other industries, are coming to grips with what they can do with the data they have and what they can do with new infrastructure and new tools. Um, specifically in financial services, I think there is a ton to be done. Um, one of the areas that I've been spending more time on in the last few months is everywhere you look within the banking industry, there's manual processes. Um, and uh, whether it's for compliance reasons or you know, fraud, anti-fraud reasons or for whatever else, right? Um, you know, a simple thing like, okay, you generate a credit card statement and somebody has to check that the, the interest and the fees that have been calculated are part of the original contract. Well, there's a lot of manual processing involved with that. Right, so the ability to, you know, take that and use smart sort of AI type of technology, I think there's tremendous uh, gains to be had there. Um, but it all starts with the data. So there's so much, uh, you know, of this is actually getting the data in the correct form, cleaning it up, and being, you know, making it ready to use. I feel that's 80% of it, and 20% is smart AI that you can use. But if AI gets the rest of the 80% in in uh, in uh, in place. I think that that's a good positive thing. 
uh, but there is tremendous opportunity there, I'd say. Uh, I don't know if I can add, right, like fraud is an area where AI has been used for more than two, three decades right now. Uh, almost all of the payment networks use neural network based models for fraud detection, for real time fraud detection when people are doing transactions. And this has been in existence for more than a uh, couple of decades. So uh, there are multiple niche areas where it's being used, but definitely data uh, enrichment, data aggregation, those are all huge areas which need to be solved to be able to completely leverage the value of this data. Actually, that's an interesting point uh, because uh, my old firm, Menlo Ventures, was one of the early investors in a company called Agency Software. Right In the 80s, they were one of the first guys to use neural networks to do credit card fraud detection. They're now a part of FICO. Uh, so to Chandra's point, I think it was one of the earliest places where uh, at scale it was applied. Yeah, on the investment management side, I think it's really, uh, you, know, you have to grapple with the regulators because you can't just tell them, hey, you know, my black box told me to buy this or sell this. You know, they're going to ask you what went into the model, what are the assumptions you made. A friend of mine actually ran a lot of uh, simulations to figure out if he can find a predictor to tell you what uh, calendar is going to be up here in the stock market. And he had 40 years of data and you know, what he found was every year Elizabeth Taylor got married. That was a huge stock market year. <laughs> eight of, uh, seven out of her eight marriages led to 10 plus percent asset market. So you don't want that kind of model running your portfolio. So, you want data, but you want good data. That's really going to be the point for your next step of the investment decision. Well, I think explainability of AI yeah. is an area that's being worked on a lot, and that I think is a key enabler for use of AI in what I think are highly regulated fields like like financial services, um, which we don't have quite yet, but uh, is an active area of research. Okay. Um, by the way, it's a great panel. My name is Sini, uh, branch of 86. Now, uh, I work at Aerospike. Um, so, database used in some of the infrastructure pieces is replacing mainframes. Like, we have some representation of the panel uh, in terms of people who use our product. Now, here's my observation. You know, I kind of worked with financial services for about, I don't know, five, six years now. Um, I don't believe anybody mentioned China. Um, there's nothing short of a revolution in terms of payments and how money is processed. You know, leapfrogging that has happened in China. You know, Alibaba is what more valuable than Goldman Sachs or something like that. I, mean, I don't know how far it's true, but it gives you an idea of exactly what actually is going on. And India is catching up. Today, I can tell you that the payment processing infrastructure in India, in my opinion, is about 10 times superior to anything you have in the US. And, and in fact, Europe is trying to catch up. You know? In fact, we know that because we use them for a thing called tips, like Zelle, which someone expects. So my question is very simple. Uh, I also work on the internet. If the regulations were properly kind of changed or loosened, or whatever it is you call it, somebody like Apple and Google could kind of Essentially, uh, do much better than anybody is doing. Maybe not probably, you know, PayPal probably will hold, hold its own. Everybody else is not going to be able to do it from what I can see. I mean, there are some innovators in the financial space. The speed at which they're moving is unbelievably slow. And the world has already moved on. I mean, and I'm old enough. Uh, when I came to the US, you know, India was so much behind compared to this. India is ahead. I mean, it's ahead by like, significantly. So, my question to you is, what do you think is going to really happen? I mean, are these guys going to get their act together, the big banks? Or is it some new instructor like Alipay coming come and basically, you know, your credit card, because of the incumbent advantage of credit cards and ease of use, they're surviving. But at some point, it's going to break, like it always breaks, right? I mean, we are technologists, we've seen it so many times. So, any thoughts on that? I can maybe definitely start off on this, <laughs> closer to it. Uh, like, I would uh, definitely say that there are other countries, uh, Asian countries like you say, China, India, who are ahead of US in different areas of fintech, right? Like, they're definitely falling behind. 
that is, that's always the challenge, right? Like when you have like a very good working system, to move to the next improvement just takes to so much more effort, right? While they are leapfrogging us, right? So there is definitely uh, uh, like they are ahead of us, and I think India has done an amazing job with UPR, right? Uh, it's almost a model for multiple other countries to implement. <laughs> Right, for everything that we all think of as uh, uh, India as bureaucratic everything, it's just amazing what they've been able to do as a country from a uh, national organization. Um, something they should definitely be proud of, right? Uh, yes, uh, there are challenges in how uh, like the companies in the US are able to build solutions which are simple to it, right? But we also need to understand that uh, the solutions are going to be tailored to the needs of each of these markets. The needs of, say, markets like US is very different than a market like China, right? So uh, the big companies are more looking at how do you take some of those innovations, try to uh, tailor it for the markets here, and definitely there is an urgency, that's where when I was asking Arvind, right? Like even big companies, everybody has an innovation arm, right? And that's where the financial infrastructure, there are companies which are still on maintenance, takes a huge amount of effort to move all things, right? That is happening, but it's, it's a challenge. My point is you're falling so behind, from, and I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm seeing the other side. And I think the needs are not as different for consumers. My, right. my kids don't use I think the, the, the thing that it is, I think, a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison, uh, to be honest. The reason is, in a control economy, you go to Abu Dhabi or Singapore, you could do anything you want in a very, very, and, and Singapore and, and China as large as it is, and India as large as it is, are actually control economies, meaning that the entire thing is controlled by this one entity that controls the entire economy. So if you want to effect change on a single point of control economy, it is much easier to deploy. Um, uh, the UK, by the way, has a faster payments network that they created. Um, it's actually MasterCard just bought. Um, and that was created as a private network, but it's a much smaller market, so they could get there a little bit faster. There's a fast race, faster ACH initiative that's going on here that's uh, also been you know, hard to get because it's a capitalist economy. The government is not going to strong on it. That said, there was an, an announcement that was made earlier this year, that uh, or late last year, that basically said the government may actually come up with actually creating their own uh, more government control network. And if they did, you could do this. But I think part of it is that there, there are safety and soundness issues with a, a, an economy that's actually uh, running on its own, so to speak, rather than from a central point of control. And so it, you have to be a little bit more careful in the US than you have to be in India or China to, to roll out something like that. And, let's and take one, way, and it's okay, still let's early take one days, last right? question here. Oh, sorry. And, and I was going to say, it's still the early days. The guys who are also actually enjoying the payments and infrastructure in India are the fraudsters. Right? There are like massive amounts of fraud that are going on where people are using UPI and setting up UPI accounts and jipping people off. One of my friends got jipped off for $900 recently because of UPI. And so they still need to figure out a lot of that and the legal infrastructure for that and all that kind of stuff. But Fair point that they've let it run and now they have to catch up in terms of safety and soundness. Hi, uh, so uh, my name is Ananjay and I'm a master's student at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, so I just came here eight, nine months ago and I just identified some problems that you know exist as far as payments goes in America. So number one is uh, you need to have your credit card or debit card and ID with you at all times. Uh, because Apple Pay and Google Pay, they don't work everywhere. Uh, number two is there are just so many wallets. There's Venmo, Zelle, and uh, you know Samsung Pay, Apple Pay, which just creates a confusion. You don't know how much you're spending. You know you have problems with budgeting. And number three is uh, overdraft. So what happens is because uh, you kind of you know spend more time checking your social media posts and how many likes and followers you have, you don't actually see how much you spend. <laughs> and the last one is if you want to come up with a new payment system, it's got to work with, it's got to be easy to implement. You don't want to, you know, send out new, uh, you don't want to spend money or make merchants spend money in buying new devices. So what if, uh, 
you know, someone came up with some kind of a system called Simple Pay, where every merchant has like a QR code, and the person, like, let's say someone like me, uh, we uh, kind of have an account where we authenticate using biometrics and let's say using like SSN. So you also have your age on there, so you can like, you know, kind of scan the QR code and it only allows you, let's say, buy alcohol at a liquor, sco liquor store if you, you know, have that in the system. Uh, would something like that kind of uh, work in the United States? So I think uh, the QR code pay payment systems have kind of been very successful in all different parts of the world. Uh, they've generally not taken off in the U.S. I think it has to do with, again, consumer adoption and how consumers tend to uh, use their systems. Those kinds of things have historically not taken off. But then again, every 10 years, I'm a big believer that every 10 years you should try everything again because there's a whole new generation of, of consumers that basically become uh, people that were in school and never used financial services that actually start using financial services. And every 10 years there's a whole uh, a quarter of them that changes how financial is perceived every 10 years. So, um, historically, it's not worked in the U.S. because of user adoption issues. So, great. Thanks, everybody. That was a very engaging uh, Q&A session. Thanks for having us.